Uh, okay, to uh, uh, who's happy being a slave <laughs> and a uh, human, and this is like about human condition, and who, and uh, it, yeah, that's, you got nothing good for me today. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, so this one's called The An Antithesis of the Human Condition, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Oh, it's 
I Yeah, because I didn't want to, I, I have a huge bottle of water. Uh, it's called, 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 We're almost at the end. Um, and then there's a few more movements. The Art Nouveau movement. Has anybody heard of Art Nouveau? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now, none of that. Um, all of you being fine art photography majors, with the exception of Chris, who is practicing within our arena anyway, um, is it used lithography. It didn't use letterpress. So by using lithography, which is kind of, kind of painting and drawing on your designs, the design aspect of the typography got much more dynamic. Um, also around this time of Art Nouveau, there was the modernism movement. So if anybody's seen any modernism text prints, there's a good example in the book. It's very basic. It's essentially modernist artists, just they only put down what is essential. Um, very simple. Uh, this visual style wasn't that successful at first, but it kind of caught on especially in Germany. Um, also, right about the turn of the 20th century, two things happened. There were private presses that began being in operation. And this is because, okay, so technology has created these great advances in typography and sped everything up and made things cheaper, like money-wise, but it also tended to make things cheaper quality-wise. Um, you could run sheets of paper through a machine and get some, you know, some ink on it that you didn't intend, um, and that was okay, but these private presses said, okay, we're going to print things ourselves and we're going to have a really, really high quality, even high quality paper. Um, so private presses really put the kind of quality back into uh, typography. And we get to about 1900, <clears throat> which is, remember sans serif, they were kind of created back around 1800. Like, you need to build up your resume of exhibitions, and so going for a non-jury show is a great entry level to work show. This is where I started. Like when I was an undergrad, it was all about solar culture. You go down to solar culture, you take your work, you drop it off. Three months later, you pick it up. It might be kind of from Spain, um, big prints, cool print. But like that's how you build up your resume, and then somebody sees your work and they're like, hey, the drawing of that hand was really funny. Do you have others? And then eventually they might buy something. Um, and or give you an exhibit, so you should do that. And then we're going to go gallery. So, it's on Congress, it's like Congress, it's right at the end. It's like across the street from the Congress, when, uh, when, I can, um, I have some information.
just six months ago, this was a 59 Cadillac Eldorado Barrett convertible. Now it sits before us transformed by over 1,500 hours of handcrafted work by the members of Ant Farm. Inside, the driving controls have been moved aft to make it a two-seater, thereby extending the hood line to 18 feet as a homage to Harley Arrow. The two dummies will drive by closed circuit television. There is a camera mounted in the vertical tail fin and protected by a Lexan shield. They will view a monitor mounted between their bucket seats. They will be receiving a digital countdown on their TV screen as well as digital speedometer readings. To minimize danger, Ant Farm has formed reinforced fiberglass canopies which fit where you now see the clear ones. The right side door will function as an escape hatch. The car will hit the TV sets at approximately 55 miles per hour. The Phantom Dream Car will be for sale after the event. Something that everyone would like to have in their garage.
happened. And then all of a sudden, she's all ready to beat some girl up and go crazy. So it's just like, yo, that's out of control. Chill. She's like, no, I don't want to deal with all this bull crap. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to deal with all. Jesse, is he like a whole like the house dirty and like a whole bunch of kids and like you know who can use this drink or something like that? Or take time out, yeah. yeah. So I did anything like that, yeah. You know, like, 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 like Starbucks though, like when I was there, it's like part of the atmosphere. It's like it's a way for people who can't afford to go to Paris and sit at a sidewalk cafe. It's yeah. Like that. It's yeah. Like a mini vacation, like. And it's a little cultural. Like yeah. you have some music, nice music you can listen to. Definitely. There's art. Why? But I thought... Nothing. Another, I reply that I might have a difficulty in explaining, but I am sure that you will admit the proposition that I am about to make. What is the proposition? That since beauty is the opposite of ugliness, they are two, certainly. And inasmuch as they are two, each of them is one, true again. And of just and unjust, good and evil, and of every other class, the same remark holds. Taken singly, each of them is one, but from various combinations of them, with actions and things and with one another, they are seen in all sorts of lights and appear many. Very true. And this is the distinction which I draw between the sight-loving, art-loving, practical class, and those of whom I am speaking, and who are alone worthy of the names of philosophers. How do you distinguish them? he asked. The lovers of sounds and sights are, as I conceive, fond of fine tones and colors and forms and all the artificial products that are made out of them, but their mind is incapable of seeing or loving absolute beauty. True, he replied. And he who, having a sense of beautiful things, has no sense of absolute beauty, or who, if another lent him to knowledge of that beauty, is he awake or in a dream? Reflect. Is not the dreamer sleeping or waking, one who likens dissimilar things, who puts a copy in the place of the real object? To take the case of the other. <laughs>
Um, I'm going to be going over uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, they started as picti pictograms, and in 3000 BCE, they evolved into more complex pictograms, ideograms, and phonograms. Um, at 1500 BC, then the Phoenician people they used a, an abstract um, pho phonogram based alphabet of 22 characters. The reason for this uh, was the that the Phoenician uh, they had a, was a center <laughs> of uh, of trade for merchants. Um, and in 1000 BCE, the Chinese developed calligraphy, and the way this happened is they observed the marks that animals make, like footprints and claw marks, and from that they developed phonograms, to, uh, which led later on to their own language. Uh, about 100 BCE, the uh, Romans took over what was Greece. Uh, like what they saw, adopt, uh, adapted it. They used that and uh, let's see. southern Italian or Etruscan influences, and uh, they used they developed what we would pretty much call modern letter forms. You know, kind of made them look nicer with serifs and such. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have a quick, um, for each group, I'm just going to have like a follow-up question. Um, so, you know, there was, there was discussion in this typography book about casing pictographs. Why would a typography book talk about that? If anybody else has an idea too, they can shout it out. Okay, started. Yep. It was an actual form of, of, of written communication that hadn't been actually standardized at the time. I mean, you can paint a horse and everybody knows it's a horse. Right? <coughs> yeah. Also, in some of the letter forms in certain languages, you can see development from the pictograms to the characters that they end up with, like the Druids. Right. Did you ask what the that's got? No. No, I didn't do that. Okay. Very good, exactly. Okay, moving on to group two, beginning of written language. The Greeks uh, adopted the Phoenician alphabet, and when they did that, they had to add a few vowels and a few consonants to uh, kind of round things up. After the Greeks had uh, gone, gone along with it for a while, they used big capital letters. Know, there was no, uh, there was no round shape to them or anything. And then, um, let's see what happened. Then the Romans took over and uh, stole everything they could steal from the Greeks and made it their own. And when they did, uh, it caused uh, we got smaller, like smaller letters in that uh, uh, Roman period there. And let's see what else. Those are called the unicorns. Okay, take it. Take it. No, I was just, I was just. 
helping you. Well, no, no, they, no, they had, they had square letters. No, yeah, they had large capitals, and they went to smaller capitals, oh, really? and then they went to Unicode, I believe. Unsealed, correct? Pardon? Unsealed? Yes, they are. They are. They're called. I know. The first time you read that, you kind of transpose the I of C. It's unsealed. And yeah, I think Unicode is cool. Unsealed. <laughs> <laughs> Unicode does sound fun. Yeah. But an unseal is, is, think of it as a precursor to a lowercase letter. It's kind of the simplest way to think about it. I'll go into the technology. Um, in 2000 BC, the Egyptians um, also did the um, chisel and stone type of um, hieroglyphs, but uh, they started using um, stems from, from plants and um, from a plant named uh, Cypress papyrus plant. They made paper, like a certain type of paper, and um, they used that, and it was very portable and easy to use. That's my part of it. Um, uh, 190 BC, um, Greeks invented parchment. Uh, it was invented by a shepherd from a place uh, that is in modern day Turkey. It is made out of animal skins, um, unlike paper, it's not animal friendly. Uh, 2000 CE, uh, half uncles who were three little dinosaurs, or whatever they're called. Um, <laughs> <20 CE. laughs> They're like short ascenders and descenders. They're like, they came after unsealers. Yeah, they're like precursor to large descenders. So, yeah. I think we should do another song though.
Okay, so the X stays for that one. Okay. And uh, Nick Murray. <laughs> Nick Murray, right there again. All right. Next, we have Justin Knapsiger and Nathan Stenner. Stenner. Right there. Yeah, the name is like three minutes long. So, uh... Tripod! I don't, I can't, I can't. Alright. And a big hole burns in the film. So it's All right. Play! <laughs> Excellent. No, no, that's, that's not, seriously. <laughs> Bring up the lights. We can't. Unless you can see, maybe they can get it working and we can try again later. Right? No, seriously. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. What's that? You guys got to just be here earlier with your little filmy films, Egg Nation, whatever the heck it was. Egg Nation Chronicles. Um, I, 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 uh, oh, Jeff. Did I talk about George Carmonica's film or what? That, yeah, that, that was amazing. That was like pornography by the special ed class. The, <laughs> it was amazing. No, I hope Bill Kalanick never stops making films, because they're always amazing. I love when through the close to the people. He's a rock star. I don't know what's going on with Danica, I don't know. So what about the last one, nothing to say? Now, does this mean that we're ready to go back? I think that was a thumbs up. Yeah, okay, we're going to try that last one again. That's great. That's really great. <laughs> yeah, I heard Danica had this like crazy party last night. Yeah, she has to answer her sidekick all day, so I'm here to check on her. I'm gonna call you. Bye. Danica? Hey, Danica. Oh my god. Danica. Da Danica, get up. Janica, you had a party last night? Janica. What? You had a party last night? I told you I'd call you, Blake. Janica! Janica, I need to cry! What? What? I need to cry, Iron! What? You're crying, Iron! What? You're crying, Iron! Janica. What? You had a party and you didn't invite me? Uh, you didn't invite me? You Why didn't you invite me? I don't know who I invited. Janica? I probably invited Janica? my brother, who was probably supposed Jan to tell you. Janica? Janica? <laughs> Why didn't you invite me? Did you not just hear me? Oh, no, no, I was looking in the mirror. No. I don't know who I invite. Janica! I need your straightening iron! What, Angela? I need Jenica S. Thorne, what are you even thinking? You did not invite me to your party? You know, I am really stressed right now. My mom took the car, my dad... He didn't even... Jenica, I'm sorry, Jenica, I swear to God, I'm going to... I don't even know what I'm going to do. Jenica, sit down. Is that my shirt? Jenica? Get it! Get it!
Joe Carmonica's film seem a lot better. All right. Anyway. They should have tried to eat Danica. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Um, and this is the portion where I needed to take a little extra time to give them time to set something up, right? So, um, now, um, you guys, I'm going to explain this now. You know how this is going to work at the end? Uh, most of you do. At the end, we're going to take the ones that didn't get gone, and we're going to, uh, you know, I'm going to name them out, and you're going to uh, vote by applause. And... Oh wow, you're not like not vertical right, yet. Not yet. You're on this side. Oh, you know what? I want I want to walk by the gallery really quick. Is it your gallery? Yeah. Oh, there's a cop right there. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Do you want the cop? Oh. <laughs> Well, like, I think I'm wearing a good thing for it. Oh, right, right. Um, I don't even notice. Do you want to run in the gallery with me real quick? Yeah, sure. Can I videotape it? A lot of galleries, they don't like that. New York gallery, oh anyway. What? Oh my god! What the hell is this? Oh my god, this, oh, this is... the goddamn windows! Oh, cool. So that, like, um, you don't get in trouble for what's inside. No. Nah. Nonsense. Well, you asked, like, give me your tea out there. You can't stay there. Oh, wow. So there's your pieces. Yeah, there's nothing to be. There's nothing to be. Okay, they're just stirring up trouble. What are you stirring up trouble? They're just creating mystery. Yeah, that's why. That's really nice. That's really nice. Yeah. Excellent. Good for, good for us. Great. Cool. Where's your cards? Oh, there you are. Birds were free. <laughs> nice. Do you love this place? One, two, three, four. I love this place. What is this? Oh, the art space? That's dinnerware. That's dinnerware? Yeah. What is this? A club? Satan club? Bar. Have you ever been in here? Yes. The Chicago place? How is it? Oh, uh, I haven't been in there. Oh. And it's, sorry, and it's not green anymore. What do you want from me? The fuck you always asking me for shit for? You always want me something. Yeah, can you give me this? Right. Oh, I've been in there, that's a good stuff. Yeah. I think I'm more interested in what's next door. <laughs> <laughs>
No trespassing.